Hello and welcome to the Lagos broadcast. This is being recorded on Wednesday, the 24th of April. I'm in Ireland. Graham Canton is with me. He's speaking from Alabama. And Philip Swanson is speaking in Syracuse, New York. Lads, I don't want to overdo this, but I think it could be called for because you've been on the, the broadcast several times. So, Philip, could you give us a brief update on what's going on in your world? Maybe specifically touching on your experience with orthodoxy after a few months in the thick of it and also why were you in Maine recently and so on and and maybe try to make this relevant to the broader discussion that we've been having um as opposed to just you know things that are trivial and won't be of interest to people listening yeah so one I don't know if I'm leaving Syracuse yet so uh it it's it's a possibility um but overall yeah my experience with orthodoxy after I would say a few years of looking into it me, my wife, and my son will, uh, thanks be to God, be received into the Orthodox Church uh, this Saturday, Lazarus Saturday. Um, so it's a big, big, exciting moment for all of us. Um, you know, thanks be to God for for leading us down this path and, and helping us to, you know, please God on Saturday, see it through. As some of your listeners may have known, I've been teaching at a SSBX school when I started here. When I started the job, I was Catholic on the fence of becoming Orthodox. Jump ship, um, I would say, into the better ship, into the true arc, so to speak, became Orthodox um, rather than the one with a bunch of holes in it with an infallible autocrat at the helm. <laughs> Sorry, infallible autocrat. Um, but in all seriousness, I think it's, it. yeah, I've been... With, the, with touching on the Maine thing, yeah, I went and visited Maine this past weekend um, just to check out a a parish there. Uh, there's a priest that, you know, may or may not, you know, is looking to for people to come and help at the parish. And he's he seems like a great priest. So, you know, perhaps me and my family will, will go out there. And, you know, as a matter of it not being trivial, I, I mean, I think this whole thing is all about finding the right community in which to actually live one's one's life right we have so many options or we sort of have this plethora of options kind of vying for our attention and just thrown at us and we're always trying to find the right community and so i think instead of you know at a certain point it comes to the point where it's like okay well where are you going to find the right community i mean obviously it's it's going to be it's going to be centered around the church it's going to be centered around around the church so that's my my two cents Right, Graham, how are things with you, broadly speaking? I know last time we published the, the broadcast on Orthodoxy, you were saying you're kind of teetering and you've just been to Vespers, etc. So where's all that at and, and where do you see things going? Yeah, October, I went to Vespers for the first time uh, at a Greek festival. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I haven't been to Mass since then. So Vespers was the first day really celebrating any sort of service at an Orthodox church and the last day that I was in practice Catholic. And then maybe a couple of months ago, I, I decided that I would start discerning Orthodoxy, not as another option, but as the thing I wanted to do. Um, and so that was kind of the, the switch, if you will, into the into the Orthodox camp. And, and now I'm pretty much, I'm jonesing for chrismation. And that that's where I stand. Uh, it's tough. It's tough where I'm at. Because the communities, they're, they're not like, uh, there aren't a bunch of communities to choose from, like there might be in the Northeast, where Philip is. Yeah. But I'm, I'm doing it anyway. I'm doing it anyway. So that's pretty much where the, where the updates end on the Orthodox thing. And I suppose for you to be saying, well, I don't have all the choice in the world. You have some experience of that with the traditional Latin mass movement, where you don't always have, you know, daily mass in Latin as, or whatever. Do you know what I mean? It's not like... Mm -hmm. You had everything you wanted in the Catholic Church, and now you're kind of looking around. Isn't that right? Yeah, like actually, a hundred percent. And uh, becoming Orthodox came with its own difficulties that are that are like adjacent to the difficulties I had being a traditional Catholic. Uh, one of them being, like, a bad liturgy means so much more in in Orthodoxy because the spiritual life is far more liturgical than 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 a lot of people understand. You know. In Catholicism, you have this thing where you're a traditional Catholic, and if you want to receive the Eucharist, you just like 
bum off to some parish down the road and at, for daily mass, don't participate in the mass, and then receive Holy Communion. So, yeah, it's uh, in Orthodoxy you can't really you can't really do that. It's like there's one parish you should be happy, uh, and there's not like a bunch of daily masses that you can go to to cope and and all that. Like you really have to figure out where you are and where you belong and <clears throat> what liturgy actually is. Um, it, I don't know. I think I'm struggling more, but I prefer it because it actually makes sense. Like I'm struggling within the right system. The system is allowing me f- for me to struggle and to care about like a liturgy in a different way than it, than it did when I was Catholic, you know, so. And you, it would seem, I don't know if this will be true, but a lot of the time when something's more difficult, if you do find the solution, the solution will probably be more lasting. Do you know mm-hmm, what I mean? So, so true. It'll probably be worth the struggle. I heard a, a famous tennis coach, his name is Chuck Creasy. He he would say about tennis. I might have said this to you before. If it's easy to pick up, it's easy to put down. If it's difficult to pick up, it's difficult to put down. He was talking about pickleball. It's really easy to start playing pickleball, right? But you can easily just move on to the next thing. Whereas with tennis, you've actually got to invest a lot of hours before you can even remotely play. And so once you've already invested all that, you'll be slower to just kind of toss it to the side. You know, you mentioned the word communion there. And I think what you were getting at, maybe correct me if I'm wrong, either of you jump in here, but there's something false, it would seem, in what you said, like, I'm not going to participate, but I'm going to receive communion because the whole notion of communion. Basically, it's you're together with the people who are there. Is that roughly correct? And am I right to to well, you tell me, but but there's a unity there. If, if you are just there to kind of take Holy Communion, you're not really in communion with the community that's there. Is that right? Yeah, so communion and community uh, and receiving communion are all sort of very interrelated within orthodoxy. Because when you receive communion, the presupposition is you are in communion with something. So that includes your brothers, one another which is the local community, your priest, your fellow parishioners, your family, right? All these sorts of things. But also presupposes communion with the church, not only in her beliefs, but how you live those beliefs in your very life. Um, And so to receive communion is sort of this ultimate act of intimacy, right? It's almost, it is, right? This is why it's called like the bridal feast of the lamb. Right, or the wedding supper of the lamb, right? Because it is this communal feast that's taking place. And at a wedding, you know, at a wedding, there's obviously the intimate act of, of consummating the marriage. And this is how, right, communion is, you know, eating is it involves integrating things into your into your body, right? Sort of being made similar to the things that that you eat and sharing that meal amongst each other um, has that effect. You become similar when when you all share of of, of the same meal and everyone's <clears throat> eating together. And so within Orthodoxy, there is this very specific, there's this very sort of intimate sort of connection between these things. Because when we use the word, and it's, and it's related to the word Catholic, when we say Catholic in the Orthodox world, it's the fullness of the church exists not only in each, in each bishop and the church as a whole, but within each local parish community each local Orthodox church, each parish. So you're receiving communion there, you're receiving communion and communing with all Orthodox Christians um, throughout the world. So it's this very mi- macrocosmic, microcosmic way of, of, of seeing these things. It's just these different levels of, of reality, if you will. I've always had beef with, uh, I've had, I have linguistic beef um, with people who say, take communion. Like, oh, are you going to go take communion uh, at mass? Or like, I'm not taking communion. Like, I'm not Catholic anymore. Blah. And, and as opposed to like receive communion. And I think that actually, I used to think maybe that was a strange, strange thing to have beef with. Because I would try to explain it to people and they say, I don't, I don't see the distinction. But the more I went into traditional Catholicism, the more I saw that people who didn't have a dedicated Latin mass parish, they really were going and taking communion from a place. It was like a it was like a prize to find our Lord and the our Lord and the and the host, um, and that, so they would have to go and take him because you can't really receive something if you're not integrating 
with the thing that you're receiving it from, you know? Like, you, you, you receive, if your dad hands you a $20 bill to go buy a girl ice cream, you're integrating into a transaction with him. It's like there are, there are things expected on both sides. So you receive the $20 bill because you integrated with dad's intention to give it to you and your intention to receive it and a recognition that he has something that you don't. And ultimately, traditional Catholics are saying, eh, the only thing you have that I really need is the communion, like the, the, the consecrated body and blood of our Lord. That's what they're saying. But the church is more than that. And it's a, it's a, it's a waterfall in a way, uh, or like a, a spring flowing down a mountain, as Philip one time said, um, the liturgy is anyway. And uh, in that sense, you receive it. Um, so that's that's kind of some of the beef I have with people who say they take communion. Yeah, just one more point on that. I, th- I think it's interesting. And and two, it's like <clears throat> another interesting point is that if you look at at least the church I'm at and many Orthodox churches, you'll often see just the walls just plastered and covered with icons. And you could think, oh, well, this was just some like guy who wanted to get paid more money. Because, so he just slapped every icon he would to get more hours to get paid more. Um, or you could just say he was just some you know, raging maniac who couldn't leave, uh, you know, a hyper autist who couldn't leave a single space uh, blank. And so he had to cover every little nook and cranny with with color. The reason why Orthodox churches are so filled with icons and imagery is because we believe that the saints are the body of Christ and therefore they are the church because the body of Christ is the church and the church is the body of Christ. So in, when we receive communion, right, it's, it's ironic, right? When we receive the body, it's, well, but it's not. When we receive the body of Christ, that little seed, if it will, because it's just a little tiny, tiny thing, be, be you Eastern or, or, or Western, right? It's just a little tiny piece of bread dipped in wine. When you receive that, you become that thing, right? You become integrated to that thing and therefore you form and make up the church. And that's ultimately what it means to be, you're in communion with the communion, right? With the body of Christ, because the body of Christ is, is also the church. Um, and so it's like that, it's, it's that very sort of pinnacle of the thing. It's not just something you can kind of waltz in. And this is why in Orthodoxy, we have so many preparatory prayers before receiving communion. Um, at least the longer versions of these prayers take up to an hour and a half before you can go in. You, you know, if you say these certain set of prayers, not because you know, you need to pray, not because it's, oh, this is a nice penance before you go pray, right? But if you're going to be integrated into something, you have to prepare for that because it also, it signifies also the end of something. You're having to give something up. You have to sacrifice some sort of idiosyncrasy in order to come into communion with it. Whereas, you know, in the Catholic world, I can show up to Bum Novus Ordo Parish or Trad Latin Mass Parish and just sort of waltz in, get the Eucharist, get out, see you clowns later kind of kind of thing. Yeah, to, I mean, all that being said and, and, and taken on board, one, to, to give, so to speak, to give the devil its due, um, one, one way of preparing, obviously, in the Catholic Church is the Catholic Church would say, well, you should be in a, quote, state of grace right before receiving. So it's another way of, <laughs> sorry, that quote reference <laughs> is a, uh, to a YouTube channel, which maybe the guys can elaborate on later. But um, yeah, that's another way of preparing. You're not just rocking up, like as you're saying. Now, what ends up happening, obviously, is as I wouldn't have known until Graham told me. Like, I didn't even know anything about that until I'd say relatively recently. But it's another way of doing the same sort of preparation, in a sense. Is that fair to say? I mean, I can be in a, I can be in a quote, state of grace, but I mean, if I, at least I'm using the Catholic dichotomy. It's still not prepare at all, right? I could have not committed adultery. I could have not, you know, said something horrible, gossipy. I could have not murdered someone, uh, you know, been an absolute glutton. Um, no, I hear you. I mean, you can still, but you can still be miserable or whatever, be wretched without having committed a mortal sin, basically, is what you're saying. Yeah, I, think. I mean, but, yeah. but obviously, obviously, <laughs> yeah, the, 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 the like definition is always going to be limited right or limiting but obviously you're supposed to embody something that corresponds with the state of grace do you know what i mean but that sort of denotes sort of a uh, sort of a uh, sort of a passive kind of thing right i mean like being in something 
right? Or like being in a state of grace, okay, being obviously denotes something active, but in a way it's it's often seen as a passive thing, right? You are in this, you are stuck in this, in this thing. You are stuck in state of grace or you are stuck in mortal sin. And the only way to fix that is to either commit a mortal sin or to go to confession. So, I mean, you can consider confession a, a preparatory thing, but you can go months without committing a mortal sin. But like, I suppose, in, yeah, and you're not, in what you're describing, you're not moving towards <laughs> something actively no, no. in a kind of a constructive way. No, I mean, I could, I could, I could. So with an orthodoxy, right, the night before, you start the prayers and then in the morning you'll usually finish them, right? And you have to fast from food uh, from midnight until until liturgy, <clears throat> right? Or until after you receive communion that on, on the day you receive, which is obviously usually Sunday. Um, but I actually have to do stuff in order to receive, right? I can't just waltz, I can't just not have done something horribly wrong, right? And then just waltz up and be like, hey, I'm here. I can receive, I can receive communion. I have to sit down and do these prayers. Now, obviously, if like there's a situation where you can't do them, that's one thing, but um, you're required to do them. Graham, can we maybe go from this topic to something else, which I think you could speak on very well, which is what you found frustrating, I think, in all of the legalism of uh, Catholicism and like, oh, did I, you know, did I, you know, did I, you know, do I look at that girl's shoulders and not at her hands or something? Do you know what I mean? Or like, like, did I see her knee and I should have only looked at her ankles or something? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> and like things like that, where there's an excessive uh, prescription of exactness, which is kind of stultifying or something or something like that. And maybe go from that into what I asked you about before we started recording, which was how much should the state legislate against sin? And because, for example, like should the state outlaw murder, you know, versus should the state outlaw abortion? Or I suppose some people say it's the same thing. But maybe another example is like, should the state chop off your hand for like, I don't know, um, stealing a banana or something? Like to what extent should we be how strict on what kinds of wrongdoings and how do we come to a kind of a a coherent position on 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 the difference between sinning or doing something wrong versus breaking the law right um so as for the process uh like the process of sanctification and my like beef with the legalistic perspective of it in the catholic church I don't want to dwell on it too much because at the end of the day, there are really clever responses and, and, and fair responses from the Catholic side that address my issues with it because my issues, well, I haven't really, my ideas about the issues haven't matured and I kind of like that they haven't because I became more orthodox, so they never had the chance to metamorphosize. Um, uh, so, you know, that's a good thing and I'd rather not spend a whole lot of time trying to figure out how to justify to people why the legalistic process is problematic to me and why that was one reason I left. Um, I, I like where I am now. That's one reason I am where I am. So, but with that being said, <clears throat> uh, I think the process uh, and the, or sorry, not the process, the categorization of sin into mortal and venial is, is uh, indicates a, a higher thing that's wrong. It's not really wrong per se to categorize types of sin. We know that that's not wrong. It's in scripture. But I think it, it speaks to it to a, a problem that's much more high, high up. In, uh, in, in Catholic thought um, that basically it's, it's guilt-based. Uh, I can say that uh, at least on the ground where a lot of young men operate and in the parish life, it's, it, it is a little bit guilt-based. Um, you know, oh shoot, I looked at that girl's fingernail instead of the tip of her fingernail. That was too high up. I'm going to quote hell, you know, blah, 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 anything like that. You know, like in increments matter a lot in the Catholic system. That's what I've found. Uh, at least with young men, increments matter. If you exceed the increment that is going toward the full sin, then you've sinned by degree more, you know, and, and that's, you end up getting into that whole sticky situation. Um, and so, yeah, I think the categorization at the end of the day occludes the mystery of the process of, of falling in love with Christ. Uh, I think it occludes developing for yourself an understanding of of what it means to go toward Christ in a mysterious kind of way. 
and falling in love with him as opposed to falling in love with the categories that are meant to keep you from being damned. So it's kind of a negative situation. Like uh, one thing that I consider, I never really lived like this myself as, as, as a Catholic, but I found that the, the way for me to see Christ was to avoid all of these things. It was a very negative transaction. It was, okay, if I want to see Christ, I need to love the idea of not doing the bad things more than I love the good of Christ himself. Whereas now that I'm in the process of becoming Orthodox, uh, there really isn't this excessive categorization of what sin is and isn't. There is categorization, but it's not all based on the qualities of a sin or a non-sin. And so I can actually go through the mystery of it, and I have to fall in love with Christ first before I figure out what to do differently. Because the positive figure of Christ is where the is, is now the good that I want to receive, as opposed to the positive good of, of, of not sinning and and uh, staying in the state of grace and getting my epic prize at the end of Mass for being in a state of, quote, grace. So anyway, uh, as for the state, my, my greatest opinion is that the punishment for the crime should be proportionate to the magnitude of the crime. Uh, if some guy steals a banana and his hand gets chopped off, that's an injustice. Uh, but I think, I don't know, a life for a life, in theory, makes sense because that's proportionate. Um, uh, we talked a little bit in the pre-chat chat, the proto pre-chat chat about um, about like banning condoms and such, you know. And uh, I think that's epic. I think banning a lot of sins, you know, like contraception, blah blah blah, you know, you name it. I think in principle that sounds really cool, but I think it's a pipe dream. And uh, most people that I've spoken to who unironically believe that we should be banning all of these things that are sinful have like an unrealistic political position, which makes it really difficult to actually advance the conversation beyond just, I really want to be the Catholic monarch of Alabama. Here's what I would do if I was elected king of Alabama. Um, anyway, that's the end of my commentary. No, oh, fair enough, Philip. Uh, how about you on that? Graham brought up condoms that people talk about things like porn. I don't know, maybe doing things for under 18s versus adults or whatever. Do you have a kind of a quasi answer on any of that? I mean, in terms of banning some of this stuff, it's like, I mean, I agree with, with, with Graham. I mean, if I could ban all these things and stamp my fingers and make them gone, then I would absolutely love to do that uh, because it is harmful to people and it's ultimately damaging, uh, to to society however i think therein lies a problem within some of these catholic spheres uh and even orthodox spheres to a degree um as well as pro you know sort of protestant bible thumping spheres of 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 being hyper political and I'm not saying like, oh, we should stay out of politics in general and dig a hole in the ground and go live in that and watch the world burn and then, you know, dig ourselves out of the hole later and then scavenge, you know, off the dead bones of the people who killed them, who, you know, made war with one another and killed each other. I'm not advocating for that. Um, what I am saying is, though, it's like, I don't think we're going to necessarily get things done by being political activists. You know, I've been on the march for life. I don't know how many times and, and whatever. Um, I think there are certain people who can be political activists, um, but it can't have political ends, right? Because a lot of these people are just simply moral ends, right? Because moralism doesn't work either. Um, sorry, Alphonsus Liguori. Moralism doesn't work either. It's ultimately empty and hollow, right? What, what people need is a story to participate in. And if it's just I'm up there thumping on the podium saying, ban condoms, they're bad for you. Like, you know, all the 18 year olds who, you know, dress up as furries and go over to their friends' houses on the weekends are going to roll their eyes at me. It's like, what the hell is this old man talking about? You know, it's like old man yells at cloud. No one cares what I have to say. Right. No, no one cares. Right. What 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 they need to know is where does this where does this where does this find meaning in a story? What is the story of my life? And no, sorry, you're not the main character. That doesn't mean you're, you get to be the main character, right? But you do have a part to play in the story. And are you adding something good to that story? Or is it being destroyed? 
Because it's just you and your base whims and pleasures. Yes, give me condoms, give me porn, give me whatever all day long. It's just me and my desires. You know, give me Bud Light and cigarillos and I'll just lay on the couch all day and not go to work. And get, get money from the government. Right? But if I can if I can bring people to a story and show them that it ennobles their lives and that they can actually participate in it and make the world better by it, I think that's how these things are going. Then, then at that point, you don't even need to ban them. But yes, there'll be certain people who always are able to get their whole their hands on them because the world is in is is filled with evil. There's evil people in it. It's just going to be until the consummation of the world. It's going to be that way until in, until Christ returns. But I don't think the answer is establish establish monarch, right? No, so you I, said, yeah. Go ahead. No, I th I hear you. You said I think you just said consummation of the world. Is that right? Yes. Okay, so I think this actually nicely brings us on to one of the main things that I want to ask you guys about, which was this notion of the passage of time. To quote the great. Kamala Harris, Graham, you remember that video? Um, if anyone hasn't seen it, you should look that up. It's it's very, uh, it's actually quite funny. But the passage of time. So it's like, well, when is this all going to actually happen? And correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the early Christians would have thought that the time was near, like, say, 2000 years ago or whatever, or like, you know, 1900 years ago, 1800 years ago, and so on. We've been waiting 2,000 years. We could be waiting 10,000 more years or whatever, right? But yeah, to go back to the word modicum in a little while, Philip, maybe you could quote that Bible passage and we could talk about units of time or what's meant by time. And then maybe just talk about something being outside of time. But I just want to talk about time for a little bit. And Philip, where I got this from, and Graham, where I got this from was a homily on Sunday, and the priest was saying, modicum in a little while. Isn't that right? Isn't that what modicum means? So, uh, yeah, Philip, if you could read us that, and and we could discuss the passage of time. Yeah, so this kind of... And, and the, the, sorry to go on again. The passage of time as it relates to the story that you're talking about, and, well, when is the story going to end or whatever? Yeah, so this is John chapter 16, verse 16, and the context is Christ is giving his uh, last final discourse to the apostles um, before he's before he's crucified. So verse chapter 16, verse 16 of the Gospel of John, this comes from the Dewey Reams version. Uh, so you can't, you know, you can't send me all hate mail, Catholics. Um, a little while, it says, a little while, and now you shall, and you shall not see me. And again, a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. So those are, those are Christ's words in the Gospel of John. Okay, so in a little while, right, he, he, he disappears, but it's only for a few days, and then he's back, right? And then... He ascends, and then people are like, "Well, is he coming back in a few days?" <laughs> or something. But, but it's two thousand years later. So, so, so that's a, like how are we supposed to make sense there's, of that? There's a theory about this. <clears throat> it's called preterism, I think, um, and it's this idea that basically everything that was uh, talked about in the Gospels that was to come and Revelation as well actually happened. Pretty much within 40 years of after Jesus' uh, crucifixion and resurrection. And then there's this idea of partial preterism, which is that some of the stuff that he said, that Christ said would happen, and also some of the stuff in Revelation actually happened, but not all of it. And that a lot of the stuff that was supposed to happen was um, figured in the destruction of the temple in approximately 70 AD. Um, so that's, that's, that's the more like a historical approach to that to that question what does the little while mean um i would just say no one really knows i'm gonna mute myself now yeah so i mean a, a lot of the fathers interpret it as uh, 
Christ, obviously death, right? You shall not see me. And then uh, in a little while you shall you shall see me, right? Because I go to the Father. So I I rise from the dead. I appear to you 40 days afterwards, and then I go to the Father. Um, I mean, a lot of them interpret in this way. St. Bede, for example, says he, referring to Christ, said, A little while, and you shall not see me, alluding to his going to be taken that night by the Jews, his crucifixion the next morning, and burial in the evening, which withdrew him from all human sight. Right, so... Uh, all of them are interpreting this, you shall not see me, not as I'm going to heaven forever and you're not going to see me again, but as <clears throat> I'm going to be taken away from you in terms of how I've been interacting with you for the past 30-something years. Um, now, obviously, that, that sort of plays itself out in terms of, um, you know, the ascension and so from a perspective, yes, it does look like Christ is being, quote unquote, taken away. But if we go back to the point of um, us being the body of Christ, and this plays into the um, sort of orthodox ecclesiology nicely, is that Christ is still on earth with his people. He just has a much bigger body than we can sort of sort of see with the church being the body of Christ. Right. So he's still here, physically present um, on Earth, maybe not in the same manner or in the same way that he was um, during during his you know earthly ministry. But nonetheless, it's just as physically present um, as he was right with the Holy Spirit being the animating principle of the body of Christ. Um, yeah. And so if that's if that's the case, right, if if his second coming is actually us all participating in the life of Christ or as Christ or something, does that just keep going on ad infinitum or is there kind of a is there an end point? Yeah, I mean, obviously, well, yes and no, there'll be an end point to this earthly life, right, in, in the world we know now. But we will continue to participate in that for all eternity. So the fathers say that in the resurrection, Christ will be all in all. Right. This is why we say the prayer, O heavenly king, console the spirit of truth, present in all places and filling all things. So that means a couple of things. One, it means we could say it means Christ sort of fulfills all these patterns. Right. Every story, every pattern we look to, we can find it participating in the life of Christ. But two, Christ gives, and as St. Paul says, holds all things in existence. So in the resurrection, everyone, including the damned, will continue to participate in the life of Christ. Because Christ will fill them up completely. Um, obviously, the difference is, is that those who are enjoying sort of eternal life in the new Jerusalem, in the heavenly Jerusalem, um, will have been will be disposed to receive Christ so that when he comes and fills them up, right? Um, it's not going to be this painful experience, but rather it'll be a, a joyous experience. Those, however, who are either outside the city walls in the darkness or in the lake of fire, um, the experience will be the opposite for them, right? Because if you utterly hate God and he comes to dwell with you, it's going to be a horrible, awful experience. Um, so yeah, yes and no, there will be an end to it, but also there's not going to be an end to, to participating in this life of Christ. Okay. So I want to go now to one thing, Philip, I don't know how much detail we can mention on this, but <laughs> Graham, we discussed it the other day about Philip calling teenagers, uh, heretics <laughs> and one of the, one of the, <laughs> one of the, uh, problems that was discussed at this council of Syracuse at which said her heretics were so declared was something like uh, when Jesus is on the cross he's also participating in the creation of the world at the same time or something like that right so Graham 
can you explain like to me that doesn't make any sense but i know obviously philip wouldn't be saying it if it didn't make any sense so uh can you try and make sense of that please so i think yeah i, I i'll serve as like a decent midway between fergan who doesn't know anything about the topic and philip who will die on the hill like without anyone having to pay him to do it um on the on this hill so yeah basically this idea is that uh um christ on the cross is the lamb sacrificed before the foundation of the world um and and, and him being the lamb sacrificed before the foundation of the world actually includes him creating the world on the cross so when he's on the cross he's creating the world and the whole idea is that outside of time this makes way more sense this makes way more sense because we understand theologically speaking that the son of God is the creator of the world. I'm pretty sure. Um, and it, it's Christ who, who moved the waters, who, who uh, suspended the earth on the waters as uh, the, as the Traparion on for Holy Thursday says, uh, I think it's the Traparion anyway. <clears throat> and so when he's on the cross, he's actually the redemption of the world uh, constitutes creation because it's returning everything to order. Right. It's it's the it's the restoration of order. It's the restoration of all things in Christ on the cross. And that functions as a creation, as a as a creation of a new world. So it's like there's like there's there's original world, Adam and Eve sin, and they create old world. And it's old because sin uh, gives character characteristics of old to things that that it dwells in. Right. That's why we age. Um, and that's why sinning so much can can make make you even sick. And, and age faster. So there's the original world, then there's old world, and then there's new world at the at the creation of the world while Christ is on the cross. And then right, right, right. So so in, if we understand Christ on the cross as as recreating the world or actually creating the world itself, we have to look back to Adam and Eve who were in the old world. Sorry, they were in the, they were in the original world. They sinned and that created the old world from which Christ came to rescue us. It can be called the old world because sin actually gives old characteristics to that which in, in, it inhabits, right? Which is why in Scripture in the New Testament we're told about people who were becoming sick and dying uh, because of sin and receiving the body and blood of our Lord in a state of sin. Um, and so the old world is old because of sin. And then Christ creates the world again on the cross. Uh, from our perspective, he's creating it again. But from an extratemporal perspective, Fergan uh, throwback word from an extra temporal perspective he's actually in the act of creating the world itself right so it's like if if the creation of the world is this circular circular thing that just kind of keeps happening outside of time and the sin of humanity happens in time it's more like a blip inside the circle as opposed to a disruption of the circle of this continuous act of, of extra temporal creation and so Christ on the cross is an intersection into the world, the timely world that we disrupted salvation history with in, and he creates the world again on the cross. So it's his way of kind of like infiltrating, hashtag Taylor Marshall style, the world and uh, and then and then returning and then reincorporating it back into the giant cir the circular like uh, time. Anyway, that was cerebral, but I think now we have to, is the, like the we have to ask Philip what he thinks. Yeah, no, Graham, I think that's I think that's a great point. And then from just from this perspective of of a story, too, it only makes sense that way. Right. I mean, you can look at the crucifixion as that which fills up everything and gives everything meaning. So you could say, OK, the Passover, for example, is a prefigurement of what was to happen on the cross or another way of looking at it. And it's not just, woo woo, oh, it's a new perspective. Right. But a way of actually looking at it and participating in it is actually the cross enables those people who lived before the event to participate in salvation. Otherwise, that event by itself is right in the Old Testament without without the crucifixion means absolutely nothing. It's just another random group of slave who ha slaves who happen to leave a place. Big deal. We might as well throw a grand massive celebration every year for the Underground Railroad. No offense to the other ground railroad, but, you know, it's, it's you know, obviously slavery is not a good thing, but it, the only thing that gives things meaning is that event on the cross, right? Is that event on the cross? So St. Irenaeus says this. Now, I'm not claiming to be uh, to understand this passage very deeply, but 
um, it's it's an important little quote that he has in his book <clears throat> against the heresies. So Saint Irenaeus of Lyon, uh, a French, or he was a Greek bishop in France, and obviously Lyon, France, in the third century, says this. I think it was the third century. I could be I could be wrong. Somebody can correct me. Since he who saves already existed, it was necessary that he who would be saved should come into existence, that the one who saves should not exist in vain. Now, what the hell does that mean? Um, so it's saying that it's not that it's not that Christ is plan B. It's not that God made the world. And then, oh, no, Adam and Eve sinned. And now plan B is Jesus will die on the cross. That's that's not it. It's Adam is a type of Christ. Well, in order to be a type of something. Right. In order to be a type of something, if I'm a type of something, there has to be something that pre. Supposes my existence that, that is that comes before my existence. Right. So if Adam is a type of Christ, it means Christ it actually exists before Adam, right? And John Baer, who was an Orthodox uh, scholar and priest, um, very, very intelligent guy. Uh, I wouldn't take everything he says, uh, you know, for, I wouldn't take everything he says as 100%, you know, dogma or anything, but he has an interesting insight. Um, and he says this about it. He says, thus Christ only appearing at the end is nevertheless the true beginning. So if you actually look at the story of the garden, right, and what happens. So Adam is created, life is breathed into it, life is breathed into him by God. He's put to sleep, so he dies. And then blood and water, and then excuse me, or jumping ahead. And then a bride is created for him out of his side. They eat of the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil which was supposed to prefigure the tree of life they eat. But if you eat of the tree improperly, it kills you. So he eats of the tree, it kills him, right? And they're exiled. It's important to remember that they're on a mountain as well, on a mountain in a garden. Well, okay, so let's look at the story of Christ. It's, it's, the, same, it's the same story in reverse. Also remember another important detail is the fig leaves and being naked and the thorn bushes, right? It's all there. It's the same story, just told in reverse. Christ ascends the mountain, he's stripped naked, he eats of the tree, he dies, his side is opened up, and the church comes out of it, out of that side, right? And then what? Yeah, he, and he gives up his spirit, right? So the breath comes, at, comes instead of going into him, it comes out of him, so he, he, he dies. So it's the same story, and that event... Right. Without that event, our liturgical sort of rites and rituals are just mere dress up. It's mere play. If that's not an eternal, if that's not an event with eternal significance, right, that transcends both past and and future, then we're just playing dress up at, when we go to liturgy. We're not actually participating in, because when we say we're at lit, when we're at liturgy, right, we're actually participating in that event itself. Also, we're participating in the creation of the world and the consummation of the world. So when we're in liturgy, we're participating in these things. Well, if those things don't transcend the historical circumstances in which they took place, we can actually participate in those things. Does that make sense? Yeah, basically, if if what you're saying wasn't true, it would literally be like a dress rehearsal, like, oh, we're just going to do a cover of this song, but we're not actually participating in the taking place that's present in that moment that you're doing it. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so I, 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 you often hear that the liturgy is, is a, it's, a, it's a narrative form um, because it actually it's, it's narrating the, uh, it's narrating the sequence at Calvary. And, um, and, uh, you know, this is something Catholics love to talk about. And I'm finding out the Orthodox Church believes the exact same thing. Um, but it's um, it's actually happening. It's outside of time. It doesn't make sense. But it is literally uh, the sacrifice on the cross, like, represented. <clears throat> uh, and 
appearing in time, but actually the event is 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 somewhat um, extra temporal. Um, but it's I think it's the fact that the liturgy is an, is a narrative event. It, it shouldn't be reduced to just being narrative in a story. Like it's narrative because it's not just playing out the crucifixion of Christ. It's playing out the story of the whole world. Every time you're going to liturgy, you're playing out the story of the entire world. If we understand the passion of Christ to be the creation of the world, but like in a way, in reverse, then every time you go to liturgy, you're going to the creation of the world. And that's why it makes it's only right that whenever you go to liturgy again, you're recreating yourself because the world is partly in you as well. Since you're, you're you know, we're all in the body of Christ, or at least we should be. Uh, and if you're not, you should be. Uh, we're going and recreating ourselves at the same time as the world is being created at liturgy. So it's, it's very much, it's very much like more complex than just this is Calvary, and we should all be very afraid and sad because we're watching the sacrifice of Christ again. It's more than that. Anyway, that's that's my two cents on it. So when you guys were talking about the creation of the world. That's happening when Jesus is on the cross. Is that the same creation? I know, Philip, you said it's not like an old world and a new world. Is it the same creation? Is it all one creation or is it like a recreation? <clears throat> I mean, you can look at it as both. If Christ is the new Adam, right, it is the, sa it is the same creation of the world, right? It gives meaning to that original creation because who is the one who created the world in the first place? When every icon you see of, of the created world, right? Every icon you see of creation is who's cre who's doing the creating. It's not old man with beard, or at least you know until you get to the Renaissance, um, which we can talk about later. Um, it's Christ. It's Christ. That's who's creating the world. And in fact, you'll see like you'll see Christ holding like a little doll that looks exactly like him breathing, breathing into it or, hold, you know, holding it or, or, or whatever. Um, right. So in a way, once again, if you line up the narratives, it's the same event. One's just fulfilling the first one, if that makes if that makes sense. You can look at it as both the creation and the recreation. You know, it just depends on which perspective you want to look at it from. Both perspectives are both perspectives are necessary. I would say it's paradoxically both the recreation of the world and the creation of the world. Um, so yeah, that's about all I have to add. Yeah. At this point in the conversation, we had to go our separate ways, but we will finish the conversation before too long. Thanks, a million, and see you soon.